Hello everyone in Cardio Minds channel and we are speaking today about another specific disease that may be a cause of ventricular arrhythmia which is arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy famously abbreviated as ARVC starting with this famous diagram we can see here that monomorphic VT is much more common than the polymorphic type as the mechanism is correlated reentry and usually exercise induced and up to 97.4% of all ventricular arrhythmia episodes in ICD recipients are sustained monomorphic VT. If you want to define ARVC, it is an inherited disease caused by genetic mutation affecting the desmosomal proteins resulting in fibro fatty myocardial replacement predominantly involving the right ventricle and previously called arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia but this is no longer used and we are using this terminology arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy. Regarding the prevalence it usually ranges from 1 in 1000 case to 1 in 5000 individuals with male predominance and the patient with sudden cardiac death or VF at first presentation are typically younger with a median age of 23 compared to those who present with sustained monomorphic VT with a median age of 36 year old. And back to this diagram we can see that in ARVC there are two age peaks. The first one at the age of 23 and the second one at the median age of 36 year old and rarely to present in childhood. The genetic mutations causing ARVC are usually desmosomal and less commonly to be non-desmosomal G mutation. That's why genetic testing is indicated in patients with suspected ARVC and identification of a genetic mutation is a major criterion for the diagnosis. Doesn't mean that it should be present, but it is one of the major criteria listed in the revised task force criteria and the identification of a mutation occurs in up to 73% of propans and in 4 to 16% compound or diagenic mutations are detected which is associated with increased risk of ventricular arrhythmia at a younger age. From its name ARVC mainly affects the right ventricle especially the RV free wall starting subepicardially then extending to the endocardium. RV aneurysm although they are pathognomonic for ARVC and they are well described in the literature but they are present in a minority of patients and we have a famous terminology called the triangle of dysplasia which are the most common region to be affected in the RV usually indicating the infundibulum, the apex and the outflow tract of the right ventricle. In this ECG we can see that the patient has negative T waves in the right precordial leads here from V1 to V4. We cannot see here frank epsilon waves and during VT the patient has left upon the branch block morphology with a superior axis indicating basal RV origin. So it is completely different from the outflow tract VT that is common to be seen in patients with idiopathic VT. And in the CMR we can see a dilated right ventricle with a basal aneurysm. Then the important question, how to diagnose ARVC? It is most commonly diagnosed after an individual presents with a finding suggestive of ventricular arrhythmias and the diagnostic criteria were initially proposed by the international task force that was in 1994 and then revised by Marcus et al in 2010 to improve their sensitivity while maintaining the diagnostic specificity. So we have the 2010 revised International Diagnostic Task Force criteria which rely on a combination of ECG, documented arrhythmia by telemetric monitoring, imaging study including echo, CMR or RV angiography, endomyocardial biopsy, genetic testing and family history and the tissue characterization by CMR was not included. Now we are going to discuss this modified task force criteria and this is the link for these criteria that we are going to mention now and I am putting the link in the description below the video. We have both major and minor criteria in each category. Definite ARVC is diagnosed by the presence of two major criteria or one major and two minor or four different minor criteria from different categories. Borderline ARVC depends on the presence of one major and one minor criterion or three different minor criteria 
while you diagnose the patient as just a possible ARVC if he is having one major criterion alone or just two different minor criteria. The major criteria in the echo depends on the presence of regional RV akinesia, dyskinesia or aneurysm and one of the following like dilated RVUT more than or equal 32 mm in parasternal long axis or 36 mm in parasternal short or fractional area change less than 33 percent. The only difference in the minor criteria is in the cutoff point for the dimensions and cutoff point for the fractional area change. The major criterion MRI depends on the presence of regional RV akinesia or dyskinesia or dyssynchronous RV contraction and one of the following like the ratio of RV and diastolic volume on the body surface area or the RV ejection fraction and the difference in the minor criteria is in the cutoff point. While the RV and geography having only major criterion which is the presence of regional akinesia, dyskinesia or aneurysm. The tissue characterization by endomyocardial biopsy depends on the presence of residual myocytes less than 60% by morphometric analysis. This is a major criterion and the minor criteria here, the cutoff point is different from 60 to 75%. Then the ECG, the presence of free polarization abnormalities in the form of inverted T waves in right precordial leads from V1 to V3 or beyond individuals more than 14 years in the absence of right bundle branch block is considered a major criterion while if it is present in only V1 and V2 in absence of right bundle or in V4, V5 or V6 or the inverted T waves in presence from V1 to V4 but in the presence of right bundle these are considered minor criteria. The depolarization abnormality depends on the presence of epsilon wave which is present between the end of QRS complex to the onset of T wave in the right precordial leads from V1 to V3. These are considered major criterion and the minor criteria depends on the presence of late potential or the terminal activation duration of QRS more than or equal 55 milliseconds measured from the nadir of S wave to the end of the complex. In the absence of right bundle these are considered minor criteria. And the documentation of arrhythmia, presence of non-sustained or sustained VT of left bundle branch block with superior axis considered major criterion, while the presence of non-sustained or sustained VT with RVUT configuration, left bundle branch block morphology and the inferior axis, these are considered minor criteria or presence more than 500 ventricular exercitals in 24 hours, these are considered minor criteria. The last category, major criteria, if ARVC is confirmed in a first degree relatives meeting the current task force criteria or confirmed pathologically at autopsy or surgery in a first degree relative or identification of a genetic mutation categorized as associated or probably associated with ARVC in the patient under evaluation. So the presence of a heterozygous pathogenic variant in one of the genes detected by genetic testing is considered a major criterion. While the minor criteria is the presence of history of ARVC in a first degree relatives when it is not possible to confirm this using task force criteria or premature sudden death at age less than 35 years due to suspected ARVC in a first degree relative or confirm pathologically or by current task force criteria but in a second degree relative. The questions that we usually ask ourselves does the ARVC only affect the RV or it affects both ventricles, so it is biventricular affection? ARVC is characterized by predominant RV involvement. However, RV fatty infiltration is present in 29-53% and the LV late gadolinium enhancement as detected by the MRI is present in 35-45% to of probands. So they may be present even before the patient meet major task force criteria. This means that the LV involvement is common. That's why the identification by V or LV dominant involvement in ARVC led to the proposed term of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy rather than arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy because it does not only affect the RV, it commonly affects the left ventricle as well. So the recommendations for diagnosis that CMR is a class one recommendation to meet the task force criteria, 
and in patients with suspected or definite diagnosis of ARVC, genetic counseling and testing is also class 1. Regarding the clinical presentation, sudden cardiac death and ventricular arrhythmia occur usually during exercise in affected patients, and so the high dose of isoprenaline infusion may provoke polymorphic VT in more than 90% of patients, and this supports the role of sympathetic stimulation for adesmogenity, and that's why most of the symptoms are usually related to exercise or stress. What is the situation of the relatives of a patient with ARVC? It is typically inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, less common than the patient may have it as a de novo pathogenic variant, and the disease penetrance in the first degree relatives is 28 to 58 percent. That's why it is a class one recommendation to perform ECG and echo for the first degree relatives because it is common to see the family members affected. Then the issue of the risk stratification in ARVC. Patient with RVC but without ICD, the risk of cardiac arrest occurs in 4.6 to 6.1%, while non-fatal sustained monomorphic VT occurs in 23% during a follow-up of 8 to 11 years. While patients with ICD, the appropriate ICD therapy occurs in 23 to 48% during a follow-up of 4.7 years. In a large cohort of 864 patients, 43% had VT or VF during a median follow-up of 5.75 years. However, only 10.8% had a potentially life-threatening event. And so in 3 out of 4 ARVC patients, ICD therapy is appropriate but may not be considered acutely life-saving. That's why we are speaking about these numbers. It is common that those patients develop VT, while sustained monomorphic VT is the most common subtype, but only 10.8% are life-threatening, and that's why ICD is still indicated, but not truly life-saving. Why is this talking important? Because risk prediction algorithms are based on a combined arrhythmic endpoints often equated with ICT indications to prevent sudden cardiac death. And so, increasing the lifetime risk, of course, of ICD-related complication if you put an ICD from a young age, questionable benefit. But, from the other side, there is a high rate of appropriate ICD therapy in those implanted due to an indication of post-VF or after hemodynamically poorly tolerated VT, strongly suggesting a survival benefit from ICD whereas in patients who present with hemodynamically tolerated VT, survival benefit is less clear. That's why the conclusion that identification of ARVC patients at risk for sudden cardiac death is difficult, and the evidence supporting the risk factors for life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias is still limited, and arrhythmic syncope was a predictor for subsequent events in most series of patients with definite ARVC considering ICD, but not truly life-saving, RV and LV dysfunction have been associated as a predictors for high arrhythmic risk. So after all this debate, let's go to the general recommendations for treating ARVC. First of all, you should advise your patient to avoid high-intensity exercise if he has a definite diagnosis, and avoidance of high-intensity exercise is class 2B, in patients who are carriers of the ARVC-related genetic mutation but no phenotype. We are speaking here about the diagnosed family members. Beta blocker therapy may be considered in all patients with a definite diagnosis of ARVC, even if the patient is still not having typical ventricular arrhythmias. Regarding the primary prevention, ICT, it is class 2A to put an ICD if a patient is having severe RV or severe LV systolic dysfunction, indicated as RV fraction area change less than or equal 17%, or RV ejection fraction less than 35, or LV ejection fraction less than 35, and still indicated in those with moderate RV or LV dysfunction in presence of either non-sustained VT or inducible sustained monomorphic VT at programmed electrical stimulation in an EP study. And of course, patients with ARVC and symptoms suspicious for ventricular arrhythmia 
programmed electrical stimulation is class to be to confirm if there is inducible VT or not. So it is the same practice as an ischemic LV dysfunction or dilated cardiomyopathy having unexplained syncope but with a weaker evidence. What about the secondary prevention, ICD? Of course, it is class 1 in any ARVC patient with hemodynamically non-tolerated VT or survived from VF, class 2A in those with hemodynamically tolerated sustained monomorphic VT, and class 2A in patients with definite ARVC and an arrhythmic syncope confirmed to be arrhythmic. Of course, not just unexplained syncope, otherwise we are going for an EP study to confirm whether there is inducible VT or not. If a patient with ARVC started to develop non-sustained or sustained ventricular arrhythmia, here PETA blocker therapy is a class 1. When we mentioned a class 2B for PETA blockers, we are speaking about all ARVC patients in general, including the family members detected to have the genetic mutation. But here we are speaking about patients starting to develop ventricular arrhythmias. And if the patient is still having recurrent symptomatic VT despite PETA blockers, antiarrhythmic drugs here is class 2A. In general, the antiarrhythmics has limited efficacy in ARVC, so talol, for example, is effective to prevent VT, but it did not suppress clinically relevant arrhythmias. Amiodarone it decreased the VT recurrence as compared with sotalol and flaconide. If added to beta blockers or sotalol, it was beneficial, but in a small cohort of patients. So still, beta blockers is the first choice in ARVC. We should remember that ARVC patients who have an indication for ICD, you should put a device with the capability of ATB programming not only shocks, so we are speaking about transvenous ICD, not the subcutaneous ICDs that don't use ATB, because here we have a very high termination rate for the VT by anti-tachycardia pacing reaching 92% independent from the VT cycle lens, supporting that ATB capable device is much more beneficial rather than the shock only device like subcutaneous. And in patients with ARVC and the recurrent symptomatic sustained monomorphic VT or ICD shocks despite beta blockers, catheter ablation here is class 2A in a specialized center. And here we may need endocardial and epicardial ablation because as we mentioned that the scars here are usually sub-epicardial because here both of them have been associated with higher VT free survival. So we have reached the end of our video today and the take home message is that ARVC diagnosis cannot be made without a high clinical suspicion. We usually suspect ARVC in young age, sustained monomorphic VT with left bundle branch block and superior axis, which is the most common morphology, resting T-wave inversion and or epsilon waves and dilated RV dimensions, either regional or global or impaired systolic function. Then go to CMR with gadolinium to confirm the diagnosis and use the 2010 revised task force criteria to confirm the diagnosis of ARVC. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for another specific disease causing ventricular arrhythmia and kindly check the reference in the description below the video.